Welcome, everyone. It's so great to be with you today for, I should count how many times we've done this, though, but um, we've done these Third Friday um, uh, monthly trainings for quite some time. Um, this is a project that, for some of you who don't know, is something that the agency that I represent, the Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center, works in concert with the Big Bend Coalition Against Human Trafficking to present. A little bit of information about our coalition, BBCAT, uh, especially for those of you who are joining us from the Big Bend, and I see quite a few of you are. I see we also have a, a number of people from all over the state, but we are here in the Big Bend of Florida. We meet quarterly, and we're organized out of our U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, the phone number and email for Kelly Doherty, who is our, um, our person who is our organizer there, is up on the screen now. And also, also to let you know, our next meeting will be on November 4 at 2 p.m. We're still meeting virtually, of course. Um, one of the things that we're focusing on now is in addition to what's at the bottom of your screen, which is how do we all make sure that anyone who is at risk or anybody who might know someone at risk or is actually being trafficked um, knows where to go for help and how do we build trust so that we are open and available for everyone who needs um, any support from us. I mentioned that Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center is here in Tallahassee. We um, support and assist though trafficking survivors of all um, ages, all types, sex and labor trafficking. Uh, we provide case management services. And let me do a shout out to Graciela Marquina, who is uh, Stacks. Uh, at, number one contact our community services advocate for all of our uh, survivors of trafficking we've worked with people so many partners in our community one of whom and actually all of whom you'll meet today because that's the only way we can do this work to assist trafficking survivors which is we do it together it takes a village and all of us working together is the only way we can meet the very unique and varied needs of trafficking survivors we also do a lot of public awareness and by that i mean both awareness and action um, we know that being aware of human trafficking is a pretty easy thing to do when you think about it, but actually taking action and knowing how you can be um, able to respond and um, be safe in your response if you suspect human trafficking or if you're working with a survivor is our number one focus. We also develop um, how, uh, agency specific or organizational specific uh, training programs. So we've got some information here on this. We've got lots of um, toolkits. We've got uh, materials that you can download and share on social media. We've taken a lot of time really in this time of COVID to make sure that we can digitally and virtually connect and stay connected as, as much as possible. So please understand that we've got um, lots and lots on our website. That's our web link. Um, you can go to that surviveandthriveadvocacy.org and know that there are a lot of resources there. Often I get the question in these programs, um, is this being recorded? Can I watch later? And the answer is yes, at this website, and I'll put the direct link in the chat later. You'll be able to directly link to this program and all the other Third Fr Friday programs we've had here. So you can um, watch them again or share them with your colleagues if you found something to be particularly valuable, which I know you will do today. Um, know that everything we do at, at Stack is free of charge in terms of um, our victim assistance and um, all of our public awareness training and our outreach. Know that too, uh, we are a nonprofit. And like many of you, I bet you're going through the same thing, which is having a difficult time uh, making sure that you are able to stay alive during this very challenging time. So know that if you are so moved, we always appreciate you're going on our website, checking it out. If you'd like to donate, please feel free to do that. Here's an example of some of the work we've done in terms of our digital outreach. We did this with our Leon Cares money that came through um, last year. And it's really looking at the issue of human trafficking from the perspective of the survivor and someone who might be in it. Um, we know that survivors don't identify as being trafficked. And so very often these four questions at the top are ones that, that might just get you in a conversation or connecting with someone who might be trafficked. So here's some, an example of some of our outreach materials. So today I am very, very excited to, um, to welcome a fantastic panel with you, uh, uh, with us today. And um, also mention again, these are some of our partners. 
let me start out too by just introducing the topic and let you know that yes, this might sound highly legalistic, the idea of what is human trafficking expungement and how does it work. But I always think about this one presentation that I made a while back to um, a, a group, uh, a, a community group. And when I started talking about this, which as a lawyer and as someone who might you know, want to talk about the ins and outs of the law a lot, I thought people are going to start to nod off when I start to talk about expungement because it sounds so legalistic. But know that this can be one of the most interesting and important things that you need to know about as an advocate and not just as a legal advocate, but as someone in the community, someone who's a, a child welfare worker, someone who works with both children and adults, youth and adults are eligible for expungement. And know, and you're going to find out more about this. It is so important to helping a survivor uh, get to the next step of their life when they've um, been trafficked. And if during that time they've committed any crimes, you're going to find out more about that more from our presenters. But let me just now take a moment and introduce them to you. First, I want to um, introduce to you Rebecca Zoller, who is one of those um, community partners that, that we are so grateful for at Stack. And Graciela will probably could chat in there a lot about how we've worked with you, Rebecca. But we um, partner a lot with Rebecca and the entire legal services team on everything from community outreach to specific work with clients. Um, she is a legal services lawyer and is going to talk a little bit about what she has done as a staff attorney, both with a focus specifically on human trafficking and now with a wider um, lens, if you will. But like all of us, I think when you learn human trafficking, you learn the, you know, the existence of trafficking, you know that this is something that will never leave you and it will help inform all of the work you do in the future. I'd like to also introduce Brent Woody, um, Brent Woody is somebody who we've had the opportunity to work with for a, um, a couple of times now. You got a little um, taste of what Brent was going to present today because he actually presented last uh, month with us um, when we did a kind of special topics in the law session. Um, Brent's the executive director and lead attorney for the Justice Restoration Center. And this is part of his bio that I think it's, it's so, uh, it says it all. Upon learning that legal services would be an emerging and critical need in survivors' restorative, restorative journeys, Brent started the Justice Restoration Center. And this is a nonprofit dedicated to providing pro bono trauma-informed legal services and anti-trafficking advocacy on behalf of victims and survivors. He has played a critical role in survivor-centered legislation, including our expungement law, and he and his wife, Pamela, um, with advocates against human trafficking, arrange safe prison releases, coordinate transportation, and also provide restorative housing for previously trafficked um, uh, inmates. Know that Brent has just been the expert on this issue in the state. And so we're so thrilled that you're with us again, Brent. Welcome. And I'd also like to introduce to you Jenny Urato, who is a, a lawyer practicing in, um, gosh, I'm looking at in, in the um, Tampa Bay area, I'm sure, Jenny. And she wanted me just to say that she is a pro bono lawyer who is working with um, Brent and the Justice Restoration Center. And I also wanted to note too in your bio, Jenny, you have so much information about the other work you've done in community that I just wanna herald that, that as part of your work with um, the Junior League and other entities, you have been a keynote speaker, moderator, you've done a lot in the area of human trafficking. I'm delighted to meet you and have you be part of this program today. And I wanna thank all of you for doing this. And I'd like now to Turn it over to Brent. Brent, thank you again. And um, Janae and uh, Rebecca Zoller, I think you are going to be up first, but let me turn it over to you all and we can start. So welcome, everybody. Thank you, Robin. And I'm going to try to be brief, even though this is a topic I get very excited about. I do want to give Brent and Janae as much time as possible since there can be a lot of nuances involved in human trafficking expungement and the more time they can get, the better. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, Legal Services of North Florida is a private nonprofit law firm offering free civil legal assistance to low-income individuals and other vulnerable populations that we're also funded to assist. We have five offices serving 16 counties across the Florida Panhandle. In 2018, Legal Services of North Florida was awarded Department of Justice funding 
through an Equal Justice Works Fellowship to employ one attorney to work full-time for two years to work exclusively with victims and survivors of human trafficking on their civil legal needs, and I ended up being that attorney. The training and experiences I had in that position, they just opened my eyes, they changed my life so much. And more importantly, it allowed Legal Services to use me to develop trainings and best practices internally so that any of our attorneys working with a known or suspected survivor of trafficking is now much more informed and much more fully equipped to assist the survivor in multiple ways. And we've greatly increased our participation and presence in the human trafficking space locally and statewide. One thing we weren't always doing as a firm before 2018 was diving deeper with human trafficking clients to see what other legal needs they might have other than what they had just come to us for. But now we know if someone has been trafficked, especially for any length of time, they usually have myriad legal needs and not just the one or two issues they were sent to us with. Now it's our practice to ask survivors things like, did you have any arrests? Um, while you were experiencing the situation? Or are you interested in going after the wages you weren't paid? Or have you checked your credit report lately to make sure your identity hasn't been stolen? Do you have a copy of your birth certificate, your social security card, your state ID? And the reason we ask that question is because we've learned that a lot of times traffickers keep moving their victims from county to county or state to state to keep them confused and to keep them from forming relationships with someone who could potentially help them get out of the situation. And so it's easy for a victim of trafficking to lose important documents. Or in other cases, it's just that the trafficker took the documents as another way of controlling them. So these are some of the types of questions we're asking now when we work with a survivor to ensure that we get to all of their legal needs so that we can help them get resolved. And also prior to my fellowship, I didn't know that much about labor trafficking. We weren't getting those types of cases here. We have the occasional commercially sex trafficked client. And it hadn't occurred to me before that many survivors of commercial sex trafficking frequently will have also had instances during that time when they were having to perform other types of forced labor. And then vice versa, many victims of forced labor, of um, debt bondage and domestic servitude, they've also been either sexually abused or commercially sex trafficked during the course of the labor trafficking experiences. And so to better understand and help survivors, well, that's another type of questions we'll ask is whether there were these multiple trafficking experiences. And we need this, we need to see the whole picture, the entire trafficking scheme. We need to have a complete understanding as much as we can of what they have survived so that we can fully help them. So as an organization, Legal Services of North Florida has definitely grown since 2018 in our ability to help survivors and our effectiveness. We have much more comprehensive training amongst our staff and we have a much better understanding of what help a survivor might need but wasn't aware they needed or wasn't aware that we could help with. Prior to 2018, the only legal cases I am aware of legal services of North Florida handling for trafficking survivors were we had some immigration cases here and there. We did custody and family law issues for survivors. We did injunctions for protection. And we would be appointed by the court as attorney for the child or attorney ad litem when a child had been used for commercial sex trafficking and then been removed from their family's home and were in the dependency system with the court. But now, Brent has my slide that these on the slide are the types of cases we're doing now. So much more. And I'm sure those of you who've worked with trafficking survivors aren't surprised by this vast variety of issues. Being trafficked ends up causing harm in just about every area of a victim's life you can imagine. And it's a privilege for legal services to be able to help survivors recover from these harms. One other critical lesson we at Legal Services have learned about dealing with trafficking survivors is the importance of both us as a service provider and the survivor being connected with a human trafficking specific agency provider, such as STAC or such as International Rescue Committee like we have in our counties here. One of Robin's favorite sayings, and she said it a little while ago, is it takes a village. And that is absolutely true. 
as a legal advocate taking cases in 16 counties, it was important for me and for the other attorneys in my firm to form relationships with human trafficking focused agencies because they help train and inform us, they support us, they get us the answers we need, and they help us find resources for our clients. And then as the clients themselves, it's just invaluable the help they get from a human trafficking service provider who provides case management. Thank you, Graciela, and thank you, Robin. Because with the case management, they do a very holistic and comprehensive assessment of all that person's needs. And then they begin connecting them in priority order with the proper resources to meet each need. And they don't just refer them and hand them off. They will continue to hold their hand when needed. They'll help them complete paperwork and intakes. They'll make sure they get to their appointments, that they have transportation, that they don't forget. They are a wealth of support and encouragement and information for these survivors. And when one of our clients is connected with one of these trafficking advocacy agencies, there is a marked difference in working with that fully supported survivor as opposed to one of our survivors who isn't connected with that type of help. If there are any lawyers attending this training and you decide to take on a human trafficking case, if your client isn't already connected with a human trafficking advocacy center or case manager, please do your best to make that happen. And you can always reach out to me or Robin if you aren't sure if there is such an agency in your part of the state. Okay, and now for the reason, the reason we're all here, the human trafficking expungement. So when I begin my human trafficking fellowship, one of the things Equal Justice Works told me to expect to be handling was expungement. And I'd never done one of those before in my legal career. And I was kind of nervous about it. So as I, be, as I began the fellowship, I was connecting with anyone and everyone I could in the human trafficking space. And I just kept hearing and reading about Brent Woody. And it was always in connection with human trafficking expungement. And then it would always be paired with words like foremost expert, the absolute best, a pioneer, a guru. And Robin, you just said it. I wrote it down. You said the expert in the state. That's the types of things I would hear. And I took note of that because uh, human trafficking expansions were definitely on my radar at that point. And then one day I had gotten an email that was sent to a bunch of human trafficking workers in Florida. And I saw Brent's name and email address on that. So I know a good thing when I see it. And I snagged that email and I wrote Brent and I introduced myself and I explained my trafficking fellowship. And then I said, you know, I'm hoping when I get my first expungement case, I can get some pointers from you. And Brent wrote me right back and he was so warm and gracious. He was excited about my fellowship and he said he would be happy to help me in any way he could. And since that time, over the last few years, I've pulled Brent in on too many email conversations to count where people have reached out to me wanting help with expungements or um, other services in other parts of the state. I'm in the north part of the state, Brent's in the central, so he knows more of the resources down there. I would pull him in on these conversations, and Brent always responds as quick as he can. He's truly committed to helping survivors and helping those who help survivors of trafficking. trafficking. And needless to say, when I got my first human trafficking expungement client, Brent and his paralegal, Jenny, they were there for me for sure. They were tremendous help for me. They were my expungement 101 and 201 professors. I owe them a huge debt of gratitude. They're truly both heroes to me. And any of you attorneys out there who might be considering do, helping with a human trafficking expungement, don't be afraid of the unknown like I was. I'm, I'm certainly willing to help you if I can. And there are other people willing to help you. There's this training. There are resources out there. And an expungement will make a huge difference in a survivor's ability to recover from the exploitation and injustice they've suffered. And with that, let me turn this over to Brent. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, that's so kind of you to, to say those nice things. Um, it's, it's always, it's a, it's a privilege for us to, uh, to work in this human trafficking space and, and more importantly to work with our, our clients who are all survivors of human trafficking. And uh, um, so we're, we're happy to, uh, to assist anybody. Um, I, I love what you said, Rebecca, early on in, in, your, uh, in your talk about how, how you all were learning. And um, uh, 
learning and learning and learning. And that's really what, what this is all about. Um, we are learning every day. I feel even when we do these presentations, I'm kind of like, well, we maybe know this, but there's all these other, there's this universe of knowledge out there that we still don't know. And um, uh, our clients um, are our best teachers and mentors who um, really teach us every day about what, what they've gone through, what they're still going through as that relates to uh, criminal records and, uh, and the other barriers to recovery, um, how we should be talking with them, how we should be encouraging them, uh, how we should maybe be working with them a, a little differently than we might work with um, uh, maybe traditional clients or non-survivor clients uh, in, the, in sort of the regular law practice world. And um, so it's an, it's an incredible learning process. I'm going to introduce Janae uh, Urado. Janae, tell us a little bit about your involvement with us. Thank you, Brent. Well, similar to Rebecca, I, um, I had been involved with um, human trafficking through the Junior League of Tampa, and I ultimately, in approximately 2012, started hearing about human trafficking and trying to understand what it was. At that time, I was part of the advocacy arm for the Junior League, uh, following legislation that was impacting women and children. And so we would go up to Tallahassee and, and advocate for or against some of that legislation. And I kept hearing about human trafficking and didn't understand what it was. And through the work that I did with the Junior League of Tampa, um, I met Brent. And uh, one summer when I was spending time with my family in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, something compelled me to just reach out and, and speak to him similar to Rebecca and ever since approximately 2012, 2013, uh, Brent has been stuck with me. I am a business lawyer in Tampa. Um, I have been for about 20 years. So I, at the time, knew nothing about criminal defense, criminal law, expungements, had no idea what they were. Uh, so I hope I'm an example to any lawyers that are out there uh, that this can be done. I have trial next week in one of my business cases, and uh, I'm fully committed to this to, to help Brent. Um, so it can be done, and, and I hope that uh, we serve as an inspiration to those out there that um, we all have to work together uh, to make the utmost difference for these survivors, and it truly is an honor to work with Brent and the survivors that he represents. Thank you, Brent. Thanks, Danae. Uh, we're hardly st stuck with you. We are... Um, uh, we are dependent on you, so we, we are grateful for all that you've done for JRC, and Janae is our, our board chair um, and uh, has just provided uh, a lot of leadership, um, certainly legal, legal help, um, and uh, involved in our cases, so i um, glad to have Janae uh, aboard, and, and both in the organization and also today as she jumps in and, and hopefully clarifies and and even corrects things that I may say that, uh, um, so we, we appreciate you, Janae. So as, uh, as has been said, uh, Justice Restoration Center provides no cost legal services to victims and survivors of human trafficking. And we do have clients uh, internationally um, and uh, we work, work with them on issues of Florida and most, more recently, Tennessee law. So I was admitted to the Tennessee bar in April and, uh, we are expanding our work up into Tennessee. Uh, anyway, our, our work is exclusive in the sense that we, we only work on matters related to commercial um, exploitation for sex and labor. Um, we are also a part of the National Survivor Law Collective. I just wanted to throw that out there. There are six organizations from around the country. There, there are not many of us who do this full time. And there are six, uh, there may be more than six, and we hope there are, but six of us have sort of aligned um, with each other and um, just for the purposes of support and resources and, and also drawing in other attorneys who might want to work on a pro bono basis, uh, as Janae was talking about. Um, as I said, we work on human trafficking related issues. So what are those? Uh, we're going to talk about state and, and federal, mostly state criminal arrest records. Uh, uh, what kind of issues come out of being trafficked? Uh, as many of you are already familiar with these things, coerced debt and debt bondage as a way of controlling um, victims. 
uh, complex family law matters involving custody and marital issues, uh, coordination of out-of-state counsel. Many of our clients have out-of-state issues because they were trafficked in not only Florida, but in California and Ohio and, and such. Uh, so you know, often we need to find attorneys that are in other, other jurisdictions. Uh, warrants, always outstanding warrants, it seems like in, in so many of these cases. Intellectual property rights, which I won't go into, but um, we wouldn't necessarily associate copyright and trademark with human trafficking survivors, but there actually is a nexus there. Uh, immigration uh, for international uh, survivors and federal tax matters where um, sur a survivor where a victim at the time was uh, forced to maybe work in a, a, a legitimate uh, business such as a Nevada uh, brothel and where where uh, she was 1099 for her work as an independent contractor, of course, didn't get to keep any of the money because she was being trafficked, but yet had a tax liability as a result of that. Um, we do uh, a bit of, uh, well, a good bit actually of trafficking related <clears throat> case management. So these are, are sort of non-legal areas where we uh, get involved because we have a, a, a nexus with the client through a legal representation. So safe prison releases, which I think was mentioned a little while ago, uh, where uh, my wife Pamela with Advocates Against Human Trafficking, we, we partnered together along with other uh, service providers to, to basically help uh, previously trafficked inmates be able to leave prison safely and not have to go back necessarily to a trafficker or to another exploitative situation uh, and provide transportation and get them to a, a program uh, that will help in their recovery process. Um, we're always contacted about safe housing and um, meeting trauma therapists, uh, employment opportunities, and we'll talk a little bit about employment in a, a few minutes. Uh, and, and we're constantly partnering and collaborating with other service providers. In fact, that's one of my favorite parts of, of doing this is actually working with and, and getting to meet, meet and, and work with people like Robin and, and Rebecca. And um, uh, it's really a highlight of, of what we do. So uh, we also work on legislation and policy advocacy involving Florida law. Um, Tennessee law and federal law, and we've been involved in consulting with other states on their, particularly on their expungement and, and uh, conviction vacature laws, since we have a pretty, pretty good amount of experience here in Florida with it. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about expungement of criminal records, and, and I was listening to Robin, and she, she said, you know, maybe sounds just like, gosh, expungement of criminal records just sounds so uh, technical and, and, you know, maybe this is a time when I should text all my friends and, and that kind of thing. But I, I just want to say that, that expungement of criminal records for human trafficking survivors is one of the most critical pieces of their recovery process. And, uh, and, and to be sure, there are many pieces to their recovery process. So it's not, it's not the main thing, but it is a fundamentally important thing. And I think it's important for service providers, whether, whether you're an attorney or you're a mental health provider or a restorative program, safe housing, uh, a victim advocate for uh, law enforcement, where, whatever your role is, understanding a little bit about this process of expunging criminal records is really, really important. Um, and, and part of that is, is because for one thing, it's just good to sort of have a general knowledge so you can talk to a, uh, uh, your client about it, but also understanding how, how closely linked criminal records are with uh, the recovery process, getting housing, you know, those kind of things, but also with the, the mental health side of things. So the, the trauma that's, that results and is, and is exacerbated by uh, a criminal record or a criminal arrest. So, uh, that's that's why I think it's really important, and we're not going to get into the weeds as much as we could, because we could go on, uh, we could seriously go on for hours, and you you probably really wouldn't like that. So um, we'll we'll keep it fairly short, as keep it as a sort of an in depth overview, we'll call it. So, uh, what is the issue? Again, many of you, most or maybe all of you, know that human trafficking activities. Um, 
commonly uh, result in a criminal record. So for sex trafficking, you're going to, you know, the first thing everybody thinks about is prostitution arrest, uh, which for sure that happens. Um, probably half of our um, cases that we work with do involve prostitution. But within a sex trafficking enterprise, there's also, you know, forced drug use, uh, drug sales. So you could have a, a a labor trafficking component to a sex trafficking case. Uh, theft crimes, same thing, where a trafficker forces uh, a victim to, uh, you know, steal from Walmart or, or uh, um, commit check fraud or various other uh, sorts of financial crimes. Uh, battery cases, so there's, you know, these situations are often violent. Um, so there could be a, a number of opportunities for somebody to be involved in a, in a battery case. Uh, there are certainly others. Um, so as a result of the criminal, you know, uh, criminal activity and then the criminal record, then there's this, and, and then you, you get a, a, a victim gets out of the life and again, trying to put their lives back together. The impact of the criminal record is profound on employment, on housing, on education. Uh, the impact on family law issues, you know, maybe comes to custody issues with your kids, uh, immigration, um, volunteering, just being a, uh, you, you could have a, a survivor that's been out of the life for 10 years, and the criminal record would prevent her from being a, a survivor mentor to um, other at-risk children. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the impact is, um, really goes deep. And, um, and then certainly as a, as a felon, uh, convicted felon, you wouldn't have the opportunity to vote, uh, the opportunity to, to maybe own a gun or other certain things that come along with, with uh, um, you know, that criminal record. So um, what happens, uh, again, I'm selling a broken record here, you're going to be familiar with this, but you, you, for those who are arrested in the human trafficking scheme, <clears throat> um, you have a cycle. Right, you have you have a, an arrest, and you have uh, once you know the arrest occurs. If there's if there's jail, maybe they get out of the uh, situation, the exploitation. And I put exit in quotes because I think arrest is a kind of a lousy way. It's a lousy exit ramp, in my opinion. But it sometimes is is the is the way to get out. But uh, and then trying to put their lives back together. They can't get hired for a job. Um, they can't find housing. So they end up with a lack of meaningful choices and um, they end up in a situation where um, what's the option? Well, I can go, I can go dance tonight and I can pick up $400 or $300 or a thousand dollars, depending on where it is. And uh, that can look like a better alternative than, than, taking a, a minimum wage job at Subway, you know, nothing against Subway, but it wouldn't be a sustainable uh, job. So the club then is a portal back into exploitation and you just end up in this cycle that goes around and around. And I added some, I added this idea of shame here and, and moral injury and trauma because, um, you know, I was just thinking about the, the, the traumas, the, the trauma of not getting a job, right? Maybe we've all maybe been applied for a job and not received it. You know, we got rejected, and and it impacts us a little bit, right? I mean, it doesn't it doesn't feel good, and I think um, uh, for a survivor of of trafficking who's bringing already trauma to the table, these are like additional trauma pieces to the to the larger complex trauma um, picture, and I. I'm not a health, mental health provider or anything else, but I think, again, this is um, breaking that cycle can also break, to some extent, this cycle of trauma and the cycle of, of shame that uh, survivors go through. So I just say that to, to make sure we all understand that um, uh, the, the close connection between uh, criminal record expungement and, uh, and, and just encounters with the criminal justice uh, system generally, make sure we know that's such a close tie with um, with the, the mental health side of things and the, the other aspects of recovery. So, but, but we see as a practical matter, we see this, you know, 
uh, uh, this cycle and getting a job and, and housing and education and, and the family impacts and the like. So, uh, and certainly kind of, as I was alluding to there, the non-legal consequences of a criminal record in terms of the stigma of arrest, uh, the shame, re-traumatize, re-traumatizing when you're, when you're, you know, when you remember that you have a criminal record or you remember that arrest incident. Um, the trauma triggers that come from that, the, the impact of, of a criminal record on family relationships, extended family may not understand at all what a survivor went through. All they see is a criminal record, which means that they chose to do bad things. And, and so you, know, you have uh, an impact on those family relationships and certainly friendships for the same reasons. Um, so I just wanted to add to that, Brent. Yeah. I would say also that it's it's really important, and I think for many of you that are um, providing services to human trafficking survivors, that you understand that uh, those services are not the type of services that you uh, simply provide and then you're done. Um, it, there is a lot of hand holding, um, and there are so Brent and I see those roadblocks in real time in that cycle with respect to housing, with respect to the employment. And, and so where they are seeking certain legal services from us, uh, we certainly um, are, it's not an initial consult and we're done. We um, try to remember the importance of um, not being afraid of that handholding and serving as a counselor and assisting them with those services and getting them in the right places because the last thing we wanna do is have them continually see these roadblocks and these doors shut in just the very basic things of life, such as housing. It's, it's, it's horrible to see in real time. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Janae. That's, that's really important. And if you're a lawyer and you're thinking of maybe uh, stepping into the space or you're already in this space to some extent, um, your client's gonna call and gonna say, Hey, I just had a thing with DCF, and they won't let you know. I, I can't. I can't pass a level two background screening, and um, uh, you're gonna have to walk through those kind of situations with them, both as a lawyer, but also as a person. And um, so, it, it's really it is really critical to you know to remember that. Um, so section nine forty three. 0583 is one of my favorite statutes ever um, all from all time because that is our expungement statute in Florida. And if you have an opportunity, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to, to look at it. Section 943.0583. Um, it is uh, a unique statute among our nation's expungement statutes. And uh, it is an excellent statute and I've had the opportunity to to review every other state's expungement and, and uh, criminal uh, record vacature statute uh, it is really top-notch and um, uh, we passed it in 2013 it became law in 2014 and we did our first expungement in uh, June of 2014 um, and it was it was absolutely a profound um, experience um, what what we did not what I did not understand was going to happen when we got that order to expunge. First of all, I couldn't believe it actually worked. Um, I mean, I was pleased as could be that it did, but I think I was just looking at it going, this whole thing actually worked. I can't. This is amazing. And um, and our client was who uh, who was a public advocate. Um, uh, you know, was very deserving. So there was no question whether or not, uh, whether or not, it, um, you know, it was merited. But the fact that the process actually worked and, um, but when our, when our client received the order, the order to expunge and we emailed a copy to her and uh, it was, it was this sort of profound sense of justice and uh, 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 something that had finally happened in the criminal justice system and, and on, on the part of the state that was, uh, admitting maybe a mistake was was made and, and it was something uh, something redemptive in the whole process and I had not anticipated or even considered that there would be a whole kind of emotional um, uh, justice related uh, result from this and of course we now we see it all the time every week we see it uh, but um, it was kind of like a 
it, at the time it seemed like a bonus, you know, kind of on top of the of the legal relief. But I, I've come to realize it's actually much more fundamental than that, and much more important than that. So, anyway, we uh, first expungement in 2014, amended through the years to to sort of correct the things that we didn't think about in the beginning. Uh, you know, things like. Uh, uh, clerk's fees and in what court should actually hear one of these cases if it goes to a hearing and and various other uh, things and we'll we may talk a little bit about some of the things that are still needed to uh, to correct um, and I do I just a shout out if there's anybody on this meeting from the Florida legislature um, or a legislator's office uh, the we had unanimous support for this bill uh, in the Florida legislature and among stakeholders like Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the Attorney General's Office, uh, the Prosecutors Association, it, it was uniformly supported. And in my work in some other states on this issue, I, I can't say the same for other states. There are, there's pushback all the time. And uh, uh, so I just, I just want to applaud our, our stakeholders. Um, so a lot of times other states will come and ask me, how can we get this through? How can we overcome these obstacles? And I'm like, well, I, I'm not sure because we didn't have these obstacles. We didn't have to overcome this. So um, very appreciative of, of what happened in that, in that process. I do want to kind of throw out this warning that there are other kinds of expungements in Florida. And that's been one of the biggest hurdles over the, uh, the last seven years is, is getting people to understand that that this is not the, the usual or normal uh, or what everybody kind of is familiar with in terms of Florida expungements. This is a special, um, a sp a specific law for a specific population. And it has different remedies, a different process, and it's not the same. So we have the standard or traditional or administrative expungements, which people are more familiar with. Um, which are, are generally very limiting in scope. Um, they're almost, let's put it this way, in seven years of doing these, we've never done one of these other expungements because they just did not provide, either they were not available to a client or didn't provide the kind of relief that was gonna be really helpful. So uh, I just, the important advantages of human trafficking expungement is that an expungement vacates on the merits, it vacates any conviction associated with the expunged record. So if, if we expunge 10 cases in a county for one client and five of those cases have convictions attached to those records, right? Not, all, not every case has a conviction because the state drops the charge or you know, whatever. Uh, it may be disposed of some other way. But where there's a conviction, the expunged record deems it to be vacated. So uh, that's an important, that's more than an important distinction. That's like everything. So it's very important to not confuse these when you're working with someone talking about expungements. Um, and the other is that a human trafficking victim expungement, you only have to disclose the previous arrest in two instances. And that's if you're applying for a criminal justice uh, job, like with a law enforcement agency, um, or you're a defendant in a future criminal case. Uh, which hopefully you won't be. So um, uh, in the other expungement remedies, there is a list of things where you have to disclose um, the previous arrest, even if it's been expunged. So really important to remember, uh, we have clerk's offices and, and with all due respect to our great clerks around the, the, the state, they get that confused and they'll advise a client, well, you can't expunge this because you had a conviction or you know, for, for whatever other reasons you're not eligible. Well, they shouldn't be providing legal advice to begin with, but it's also an error. So um, really important to remember that. Uh, we'll kind of talk through the process here, um, <clears throat> which again, if you're a, a service provider or a victim advocate, uh, you may well walk through this process with, with one of the folks that you're working with. If, they're, if, you know, if we're handling an expungement petition, we love when there's a victim advocate or a service provider or a, a mental health professional who's also walking with uh, with our client through this process because it can be you can be triggering um, there can be um, 
you know, trauma maybe has, uh, or drug addiction, or various things like that, which have prevented sort of the memory of things that happened and this information that we may need. So the process is um, kind of in a nutshell, we have to determine first their eligibility uh, for human trafficking expungement. And we're gonna talk about that, that process a little bit in a little more detail. We have to gather information and we try to do as much of that in writing as we can so that, so that um, because most of our clients, well, most everybody's clients these days are remote, but uh, our clients have always been remote because they've um, been around various parts of the state. So we don't have face-to-face -face meetings with them. It's pretty rare. Um, so, you know, we learned, um, going back to what Rebecca said, we, we learned and we're still learning that, um, them getting a survivor getting on the phone and telling um, telling me what happened to them in a four hour interview is not the best way to get that information. And that is how we started when we started doing this, that's how we did it. And uh, we, we realized this is just this is absolutely re-traumatizing and we, we cannot do it this way. So we started doing it in writing. So it give them the space, uh, to do it on their own time uh, with their support network available um, in conjunction with a therapist. It's helping them talk through these things. Um, so we get our information as much as we can in writing. And, uh, and we also look at cases carefully to make sure that we're, we're, that we're not trying to get more information than we really need. We don't necessarily in every case need every piece of what happened. So um, really important in terms of the information gathering. Uh, we make a determination where to file the petition. So if they have a criminal record in Orange County, we're gonna file that petition in Orange County. Um, uh, they may have multiple jurisdictions, uh, very common to have five or six counties worth of criminal records. Um, as of the new law that was just passed and became law in July, we can file in all of those jurisdictions at the same time. Uh, so it's a, um, a great benefit there. Uh, we prepare pleadings and all the documents that need to be filed, and we uh, e-file the petition package and wait for the state's response. And when once the state has responded, um, we know where the state stands with respect to it. Um, we provide a proposed order to the court, and we get the expungement. So that's that's about uh, 50 hours, 100 hours worth of work all compressed into um, into uh, a short slide. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about eligibility uh, for expungement. Um, first of all, the petitioner must have been a victim of human trafficking. Uh, we must be trying to expunge a, an eligible offense, and we'll talk about what that is. Uh, there has to be a nexus or connection to the arrest or, uh, or to the arrest uh, and conviction if there was a conviction. And it has to be filed with due diligence. And due diligence is the easiest one of all of these. Um, so um, under the expungement law, a person uh, has to be a victim of human trafficking, which is a person subjected to coercion as defined in section 78706, which is Florida's criminal human trafficking law for the purpose of being used in human trafficking or a child under 18 years of age subjected to human trafficking or an individual subjected to human trafficking is defined by federal law. So it's pretty broad um, uh, in terms of the definition of a human trafficking victim in, for purposes of expunging their criminal record. I'm gonna talk a little, just a little bit about the federal uh, human trafficking law, <clears throat> because again, uh, if, if uh, that eligibility can turn on the definition of a victim under federal law. So the federal law, severe forms, again, many of you, maybe all of you are familiar with this, so forgive me for, for rehashing it, but severe forms of trafficking in persons, the term severe forms of trafficking in person means sex trafficking in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such acts has not attained 18 years of age, or the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, and so on. So that's the federal definition of a victim of a severe form of trafficking. Um, so if, if an individual fits uh, 
the, these qualifications or fits this description, um, then in terms of them being a victim of human trafficking, they're going to be eligible. I want to just touch on a nuance to the federal law. Um, and that is that you have severe form of sex trafficking defined under federal law, but you also have sex trafficking defined under federal law, separate from a severe form. So the term sex trafficking means the recruitment, harboring, transportation provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. Notice that force, fraud, or coercion is not included in that definition. And then later in the statute, it says a victim of trafficking means a person subjected to an act or practice described in paragraph 12. That is this. So a victim of trafficking under federal law is literally someone who has been subjected to um, or been recruited or harbored or transported or, or provided, obtained or patronized or solicited for the purpose of a commercial sex act, even if coercion did not exist in that. I'm, I don't mean to confuse anybody, but it does mean that someone who was um, just generally involved in prostitution could be eligible. Um, so it's something to keep in mind, and I'm happy to talk offline about that because it can get a little it can get a little complicated, but I think I'd be remiss in, in not mentioning that. Um, and obviously, from a child sex trafficking, a child under 18 that's involved in any way with, um, uh, with commercial sex is going to be a human trafficking, per se, a human trafficking victim. I want to talk about grooming, and we're all familiar with, with grooming and recruitment, uh, that um, under federal law, someone in the grooming process is for the purpose of human trafficking is a human trafficking victim. So uh, really important to, uh, uh, to keep that in mind because you may have someone who may not have ever uh, actually been sold um, by a pimp uh, or ex uh, exploited or might be a minor who was never exploited by a buyer. Um, and, uh, but they still might be a human trafficking victim as defined by federal law. So happy to, again, drill down on that if anybody has uh, follow-up questions. And I do then just finally wanna make this distinction between Florida and federal law in terms of what constitutes a sex act. <clears throat> so federal sex trafficking involves a sex act as defined in 18 USC 2246. And I'm not going to go into the details of that definition, but it generally speaking requires some kind of sexual contact. And uh, Florida law also includes sexual performances, which under Florida law is defined as an act or show, whether public or private, live, photographed, recorded, or videotaped, and intended to arouse or satisfy the sexual desires or appeal to the prurient interest. So um, where, where federal law may not include uh, strip club dancing or uh, other like escort services that might not involve uh, prostitution, but might involve other uh, sexually oriented things. Uh, Florida law would include, would include those things. So again, uh, those can be really important distinctions uh, to keep in mind um, as, as kind of going through that eligibility process. Um, and I just will another Florida federal distinction between uh, child labor trafficking. So federal child labor trafficking requires force, fraud, or coercion. Uh, Florida child labor trafficking does not require coercion. So any child that's subjected to exploitative labor um, is going to be a child labor trafficking victim. Again, really important, not just important for expungement purposes, but important for, uh, for other services that they might be eligible for. Uh, being uh, verified as a, uh, a victim of uh, human trafficking as a minor, um, other things like that. Um, and just quickly again, I want to talk about a mentally incapacitated uh, victim. So under Florida's human trafficking law, it's human trafficking if someone's subjected to commercial sexual activity in which any child younger than 18 uh, or an adult believed by the person to be a child younger than 18 years of age, which is language that was just added uh, this year, or in which any person who is mentally defective or mentally incapacitated, as those terms are defined in 794-011. This is really important for uh, anybody screening for somebody's eligibility for expungement. Um, so 
under Florida law, if a mentally defective or incapacitated adult is involved in commercial sex, he or she is per se a human trafficking victim, even if there's no coercion involved. Um, so a mentally incapacitated person who was involved in, say, survivor se survi survival sex uh, or an exchange of sex for money, drugs or shelter, food, anything of value, um, in other words, no pimp or third party uh, controller, that person was a victim uh, of human trafficking. Um, not something that gets talked about a lot, but uh, that could be really important as you're assessing uh, whether or not maybe your adult client uh, was uh, being trafficked. Uh, so that's the eligibility uh, in terms of uh, being a, a human trafficking victim. Let's talk about eligible offense. So there are a list of offenses that are excluded from uh, expungement. And um, you can kind of see here, these are the uh, more violent uh, crimes, arson, sexual battery, robbery, kidnapping, and, and so on. And uh, when we have a case involving an arrest for any of these offenses, we cannot expunge those, uh, those arrest records. Even if the arrest it did not result in a conviction. And that is, I will tell you, something that we're trying to get changed. Um, we think it's really manifestly unjust for uh, someone who may be, uh, say, a, a, a trafficking victim whose trafficker is robbing a sex buyer. So the sex buyer shows up you know, for the date and, uh, and the trafficker is hiding in the bathroom uh, the victim is out in the front part of the hotel room. Trafficker comes out, robs the, the sex buyer, uh, and then our client, the survivor, gets arrested and charged with, with robbery. Maybe the state immediately realizes, oh, this was a mistake. They weren't, they weren't involved in this. This was the trafficker. It's too late. We cannot expunge that robbery charge. And you may say, well, it didn't result in a conviction. I'm going to tell you that employers and landlords don't care. If they see a robbery arrest on a, on a criminal arrest record, that's, that's enough. So what we're trying to change the law to is that any of these excluded offenses, if they did not result in a conviction, that we can still expunge those charges. And uh, I, think we're, I think we're going to have good success on that. I think we're going to get that passed. And that's going to impact a, a number of our clients. Um, so... Excluded offenses. Um, however, let me say, if you're thinking about referring, if you're a service provider and you're thinking about referring uh, someone to us or to another a pro bono attorney, and by the way, always pro bono, no attorney should ever charge uh, to, to do one of these petitions to expunge. So if somebody, if you contact an attorney and they say, well, that'll be $2,500, hang up right away and please call us. Um, because there are resources, and we will handle that case. Uh, Rebecca will handle that case. There's there are resources to do that. Anyway, um, and now I lost my train of thought in terms of the referral, but whatever that was, maybe maybe we'll remember it. But um, so there has to be the nexus or the connection to human trafficking. So um, the offense or offenses must have been committed or reported to have been committed while the person was a victim of human trafficking. And as a part of the human trafficking scheme of which the person was a victim or at the direction of an operator of the scheme. This means that almost anything that a person does within the human trafficking uh, enterprise um, is going to be uh, is going to have a nexus to human trafficking. So the trafficker may um, force them to drive to a date and their license is suspended. They may get a criminal traffic charge. Uh, they may be forced to drive while they're intoxicated. They may be forced to, to be involved in, uh, uh, to be taking uh, drugs. They may be being controlled by, by drug, uh, a drug addiction. Um, they may have to steal to, uh, to get um, uh, deodorant or anything else that they have to have. I mean, there's so many scenarios within, uh, um, within the trafficking scheme. Um, so uh, that it, it's pretty easy to find a nexus if it, if it occurred during that time. What are more difficult is to find the nexus when they occur at a different time. So if, if, uh, if your client's been out of the life for two years and they get a DUI, indeed, that DUI may be 
a, a direct result of trauma and the things that were related to the trafficking, but it's not going to be within the trafficking scheme. So, um, uh, so anyway, just determining what that nexus is um, and, and whether that nexus exists is part of the process. I want to just speak to that briefly, Brent. Um, I wanted to share with everyone, I had a business client that expressed to me he had a daughter that had some substance abuse issues and he understood that she was uh, living on the street in South Florida. Uh, he had already uh, spent thousands of dollars uh, in rehabs for her and he was just really lost. And the more that he described her situation, the more I thought she was a victim of human trafficking. And I asked him uh, when he was ready, if I would have an opportunity to speak to her. And I ultimately had that opportunity. I referred her to Brent uh, and Brent was able to, through consulting with her, determine that she was in fact a human trafficking um, victim and that there was this nexus to human trafficking. To my client, her father, she was uh, a drug addict, she was a prostitute and he just didn't know what how to deal with that. And I, I'm happy to report that she's doing so well and she's working and her life has just been completely turned around because Brent was able to uh, formulate this nexus to human trafficking. Um, so just keep that in mind when you are speaking to individuals that, that you suspect might be a victim. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so the, uh, uh, the other piece of this is due diligence and uh, um, you have to file with with due diligence nobody knows exactly what that means um, because there's so many factors in in when a when a survivor might first of all it hasn't been law it's been law for seven years right so uh um you, you know uh, a survivor might not know about the law there's so many reasons why there could be a delay uh for years um as to why somebody didn't petition to expunge uh, a survivor might not have identified as a victim for a decade after they got out of the life. And, and so there's so many reasons for due diligence. I'm not even entirely sure why we have that, that requirement, but uh, it, it's there, but it doesn't create any kind of real roadblock. Um, just some general things about expungements there. Uh, and some of these kind of, kind of blend in with the myths or with the things, the misunderstandings. There's no limitation on how many arrests or convictions may be expunged. We did a petition expunge of over 50 cases in one county in a single petition. And so there's, there's no limit. Uh, as of July 1 this year, we can file in multiple circuits at the same time. There may be strategic reasons why we don't wanna do that, but it, it does open up the possibility of not waiting <clears throat> um, for one petition to be filed and get finished and then start another one because that can take years uh, to do so, we've we've remedied that part of the law, and then there are legal standards or pr uh, proof standards for uh, the judicial determination of uh, petition expunge, which is when we have official documentation that tends to show that the petitioner, our client, was a human trafficking victim. Uh, then we have a preponderance of the evidence proof standard, which just means that it's more likely than not that they're entitled to the expungement. Uh, official documentation can be uh, uh, an arrest record that, that notes that human trafficking may have been involved. Uh, it could be a letter from the FBI. It could be a letter from a prosecutor. It could be a victim testimony in a case against a trafficker. It could be a, a uh, and this is maybe somewhat controversial, it could be a letter from a, an agency, from a service provider. Um, so there's a number of ways to get that official documentation. When we don't have official documentation, we have a clear and convincing evidence proof standard, which as you probably know, is a little higher. Uh, well, that's actually a lot higher. It's a, it's a much more difficult uh, burden to, to meet. Um, but we have ways of, of working around that with cooperative uh, state attorney's offices who will, who, uh, will interview our clients and talk about, uh, talk with them uh, from a victim, in a victim-centered way, talk with them about what happened to them and then the state will come to its own conclusion as to whether or not they think um, you know this is a petition that they want to agree with in every case so far uh, they have and um, 
that process has worked out well. That's particularly relevant um, for, for uh, survivors who were trafficked 25 years ago and who learn about this law and come forward and, and they know what happened to them, but there's no, nobody was getting arrested for human trafficking 25 years ago. There was not even a, a, a law that, uh, that identified that. Um, so there'd be no paper trail, no documentation, nothing, more than likely nothing that we could sort of hang on to and say this shows that they were a human trafficking victim. So um, really important to, to have that in mind. So what documents get filed? Uh, the survivor's sworn statement. We talked about information gathering a little bit ago, and that's why we gather that information. It's to create a, a sworn statement, which is the survivor telling her or his um, not his story because his story, her story is going to be much bigger than just what happened to them, but it's talking about what happened to them and maybe childhood experiences and giving the, the state and the court an opportunity to, to, to see what, you know, to sort of be on their journey with them. And um, so we have this sworn statement, we have a petition to expunge, official documentation if there is any, uh, a notice of confidential information or a motion to determine confidential information. Uh, because we don't want these pleadings, especially the sworn statement, to be uh, available publicly because they may name, have the names of traffickers, uh, the names of other victims, the name of a service provider. There's lots of things in those uh, documents that we do not want to have uh, publicly available. Um, and uh, um, so that's, you know, that's the process of filing actually the technical side of filing is the easiest part of the whole thing it takes us just a little bit of time to e-file mostly and print everything out and uh, serve it as is required and so what then does the survivor petitioner have to do um, through the whole process really the, the most difficult part is providing the information uh, about what happened uh, in their uh, trafficking situation uh, they may be helpful in terms of gathering documents in fact they're but they're often very helpful uh, in terms of uh, getting a letter from uh, uh, an investigator or various things like that. Uh, in certain circumstances that we talked about a second ago, they may need to be they may do, need to do an interview with the prosecutor, but it's really important to keep in mind and to assure them that they will not have to go to court. It is not a court hearing is not required under the statute, and we rarely have them. And in, when we do, that um, petitioner was not going to be required to go to court. So now it may be a strategic decision to for them to go to court. There may be circumstances where it would be beneficial, but generally speaking, we want to avoid the, the, the trauma of going back into a courtroom, possibly the courtroom that they were uh, arrested or you know prosecuted in to begin with. Um, and um, so, you know, really important for them to understand that court's not going to be required. Survivor concerns kind of blend with that. How long is the process going to take? Uh, will they have to appear in court or testify? Is their information public? Um, will anyone know that they filed this motion or filed the petition? Uh, what happens if they win? What happens if they lose? Um, and uh, I'll just say that once we file a petition, it's sort of hurry up and wait. And uh, it, it, how fast these go through depends largely on the jurisdiction uh, where we file. So if we file in, um, um, well, I won't name any counties, but some counties are just super fast and they get back, to, back with us within two weeks of filing. And uh, other counties will take a, a long time, not because they're taking a long time to review the petition, but uh, very often the uh, assistant state attorneys who are reviewing the petition are also sex crime unit chiefs and that sort of thing. So they're, they have trials, they have all kinds of things that are going on and uh, uh, they're very conscientious um, in most every case, but they also are, have a lot of things to do. So, um, you know, we understand that. So, so it can take up to six weeks before we hear anything back. Um, uh, sometimes the state will want an additional affidavit or a little bit of additional information, um, which we're happy to, to collaborate with the state on, on that. Um, 
And then the state will respond generally by either not objecting and filing a notice of non-objection or some sort of document like that, uh, or they can object to the petition, uh, which we've only had happen two times, um, thankfully, out of hundreds. So we're, we're glad for that. Uh, or sometimes the state will stipulate, and so they'll actually sign on to the petition and, and agree with it so much that they want the court to understand that we not only don't object to this, but we are we are becoming a party to this petition. So um, that's what we love to have happen, and it does happen regularly uh, in some jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> if the state doesn't object and we can move forward, we just provide a proposed order to the court and 99 times out of 100 without a hearing, the court enters that order to expunge. So completing the process based on the final order, the clerk of court is going to seal the records, going to forward the expungement order uh, to the other agencies, um, you know, the county sheriff's office that might have arrest, will, will have arrest records, uh, local police departments, uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Department of Corrections, anybody that has um, any kind of record that's related to the arrest record, uh, they have to expunge or seal their records. Um, post expungement concerns, this, this is a, honestly, this is a, a webinar in itself. Um, you know, you'd like to think that, well, once we get that order to expunge and it's made its way through the government pieces, the process that, the, that it's over, that the, you know, the survivor can confidently pull their criminal records and apply for jobs. And it's just not, it just doesn't work that way. So we have post expungement um, called, called residual issues. So we, first of all, making sure that everything's out of the government databases because sometimes it gets missed. Department of Corrections, with all due respect, misses these things or it doesn't get communicated to them. So we have to check uh, all these, um, you know, all these pieces. And sometimes our client, you know, it's embarrassing, but it happens. Our client contacts us and, says, hey, I saw this up on, on, um, you know, on the clerk's website, what happened? We have records that get taken down and then they mysteriously reappear. We've never figured out how that happens. So there's a, a whole sort of post expungement process involving government databases, uh, legitimate com uh, commercial background screening agencies that just don't remove the records. They don't update their files. And so when an employer pulls, uh, you know, a background, does a background check, then that, that expunged record shows up because the agency didn't update their files. Um, and then warrants in other counties, we have to be careful of that. Sometimes there are outstanding warrants that we didn't know about, so we have to make sure those get, um, that are related to an expunged case, so we have to make sure those get, uh, get removed. Um, I just I wanted to add to that. I, th I think this is an area, right, Brent, that uh, we really, are continuing to look into because it impacts the uh, survivor or the victim's ability to um, have, if they don't have their um, driver's license for whatever reason, they were suspended and, and the, the charges impact their ability to drive. It's, it's the housing, it's the employment. Um, so again, those core basic daily things that you need to live your life. Um, so these are these are massive concerns that, mm -hmm. that I think uh, continue uh, attention from, from all of us working in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It, the things we take for granted, um, they can't. And, um, uh, and you, you mentioned driver's license. And I just want to shout out to, to Department of Motor Vehicles, Florida Department of Motor Vehicles, how very cooperative they've been uh, in collaborative working with us uh, when we get an expungement and then we provide it to them to get driver's license, the ability to get a driver's license reinstated because of because court fines and everything are wiped out by these expungements. So um, really important. I think my time is, is coming to a close here. So I'm gonna go through these really quick. Post expungement concerns, mugshots up on commercial websites. We have a, a law uh, that's gonna come about here in another month that may provide some relief from mugshots. It won't provide relief from arrest information. So I think it's not much good as a law. And I made that known to, the lawmakers, but they didn't care. So um, they, they didn't fix that part of it. But nonetheless, if you have a mugshot, you may be able to get that uh, taken down. Uh, we talked about the, the effects of expungement, obliterating the arrest record, the clerk sealing, um, 
that we talked earlier about the ability to lawfully deny the arrest, except for those two exceptions. And that's huge on a, uh, a job application or uh, it's huge in the, in the, uh, the mental well-being of a survivor, I think. And the other thing is vacating any underlying conviction. And um, I just real quick, a, a conviction that's expunged is deemed to be vacated due to a substantive defect in the underlying criminal proceeding. That is huge. It's not just a, you know, just a, uh, we just got rid of the, the, the conviction. This is based on a, uh, an, a mistake, you know, not a negligent mistake on the part of the state that you can come back and sue them for doing, but just a, uh, a mistake. They didn't realize this was a victim. The, the, the survivor didn't realize she or he was a victim at the time. So it was a mistake to, to move forward with this. And uh, that's, so that's a substantive uh, on the merits um, vacature. So, so important. Um, vacature wipes out fines, probation, warrants. It can even uh, wipe out incarceration. So if we have a successful petitioner who's incarcerated and that is that conviction that the incarceration is based on is vacated, they're getting out of prison. So this is a huge, huge remedy. Um, and fine refunds, and I'm going to just end with this, Robin. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a vacated conviction and you've paid fines, a survivor's paid fines toward, uh, you know, in satisfaction of the, or toward satisfying the, the judgment, um, they're entitled to a refund of those fines, entitled to restitution that they may have paid, uh, entitled to court costs. It's a, again, we could do an hour on, on just fine refunds. Uh, there's a whole lot of pieces to that. So, um, Non-legal effects, we talked about that emotional reputation, mitigating the, the traumatic effects uh, of involvement in the criminal justice system, and really more, uh, you know, additional things to that. So I'll leave off here, Robin. We've got a ton of questions, though, that I'd like to start to move through. And Janae, you and I have, went, have gone back, for, back and forth a little. Let's start right away with some of these um, questions um, for both of you. And Rebecca, too, if you want to um, uh, pop back on so we can ask them. And some of them involve uh, minors. So one of the first questions was, um, you know, should you go through this? Uh, is it necessary to expunge a minor's record if, if the records are sealed um, because at, at age 18 or under the age of 18? Um, you know, do you, do you, should you go through this for younger um, people who have been trafficked? Well, so my answer to that is yes. Um, we don't know, you know, some records are supposed to be automatically sealed um, and they don't, uh, that doesn't always happen. Um, some records show up on FDLE reports, juvenile records, and we don't, um, the FDLE doesn't even know why. And so that it's just potentially gonna, gonna show up. So our suggestion is when there is a juvenile record um, uh, that, you know, that they have it expunged. And it's a, it's a little different process. So even going through the eligibility stuff and all that, it's a little different approach to, to getting those expunged. Great, great. And relatedly, there's another question. Um, if the child is underage and is in out of home care, who would be the petitioner for this child? Is it something that the dependency judge would do or, or does the, is the child able to petition for themselves? So that's a great question. And so far, our experience is that the child can petition uh, herself or himself. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, whether or not you might run into a roadblock from somebody in the system that might say, well, you can't do it this way, we haven't, but it could happen. Great, great. And you should know we are getting a lot of information in here saying Brent gave me pointers when I was doing my first expungement for a survivor, truly the expert, um, getting some feedback like that. We also have some questions here that I want to kind of put up for you too. Um, under Florida law, does uh, the definition of sex act include virtual, which I'm assuming means not in person. So camming or other kinds of sex acts. And um, my guess is that answer is yes. Absolutely. Um, so that would be a sexual performance, um, similar to uh, anything related to child sexual abuse um, material or child pornography uh, or anything like that. So yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Another question. This is like a lightning round for you. Is uh, <laughs> can this be accomplished when the justice when uh, while um, the justice involved victim is still incarcerated or under supervision or on unrelated charges? Um, so uh, you know, does any kind of of incarceration or probation stop this process uh, going forward of expungement? It does not. Okay. Okay, so somebody's asking in particular, would you help with expunging their um, records and, and clients? And um, uh, Sophia, I thank you for so many um, comments here. Yes, it looks like we can get um, help with that expungement issue for minors and you have contact information for, um, for um, Janae. And I know Brent, I think your slide had some up, but if we, if we wanna put in your contact information, how you'd like people to get in touch with you in the chat, that would be great. Okay, um, let's see, any other questions uh, do we have? Janae, did you see anything else? I was just gonna say, I saw some comments and questions relating to training. Okay. Uh, and so Brent and I, that is probably the one area for Justice Restoration Center that I, we, I love. Uh, that we can do. So Brent and I always look for those opportunities to spread the word, um, even with the um, various uh, lawyer organizations. Um, I, I, that's kind of sort of my focus in, in making certain that lawyers know about this, especially criminal defense lawyers, uh, because they're not always familiar with the, the differences uh, in, in these expungement laws. So uh, anything that we spoke about today, Brent and I are happy and willing to provide any training that anyone might need. 